One of the best feelings while reading a book is the moment of epiphany where a connection takes place. Eventually, a picture emerges, helping us make sense of our complex world. Today, Newbery Medal-winning author Linda Sue Park will be speaking to us about this very connection. At age four, Linda began writing poems and stories and published her first poem at age nine for the Trailblazer magazine. Reading was always a favorite pastime and still is. During this session, she will speak to us about the paths that reading has encouraged young people to take up, along with the roles that parents and educators fulfill in nurturing similar mindsets among children and young adults today. Please welcome Linda Supark. Thank you. I am so incredibly honored to be here today. Um, it's just a remarkable festival. It's just so impressive. And I go to a lot of them. And I tell people afterwards, don't go to that one. <laughs> you know, if, it's, if they don't take care of you, if it's not well run, but I have enjoyed myself so much here. And I'm so impressed with all that has been accomplished in a relatively few short years. So um, I have had the great joy of publishing more than 30 books for young readers. Um, my, thank you. <laughs> my writing is mostly driven by my reading because I've always loved to read. So um, sometimes the young people will ask me, what is your favorite genre? You know, what kind of book do you like to read? And I said, oh, I do have a favorite genre. It's called good. I want to read a good book. Okay? Life is too short. I don't have time to read a bad book. But if it's a good book, I will read anything. Children, adult, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, picture books, it doesn't matter. As long as it's good, I want to read it. And I have many friends and other associates and so forth, and when they grab me and say, you have to read this book, that is the kind of book that I love to read. Because of that, I write many different kinds of books. I have books for very young children. I have books for teenagers. I have, um, my favorite is what's called middle grade in the United States, which is grades about, which is ages about eight to 12 or so. So most, I have more books in that age category than anything else. But um, I write all over the map. I have had wonderful editors and publishers who have allowed me to do that. Because in these days, it is much easier to market someone who stays in one place. Right? You can build sort of a, a campaign or a reputation around them. And instead, I'm here and here and here and here and here and here, and it's sort of harder to, to pin me down. But I have been very fortunate in that editors and other people I've worked with have allowed me to do so. So uh, here are the novels for those young readers, 8 to 12, uh, my picture books for um, you know, ages 2 to 102, um, a couple of poetry collections, and many anthologies. I will tell you a little bit about, about my family first, because they have been so important in my growth and development as a writer. My parents immigrated to the United States from Korea back in the 1950s, um, during and af just after the Korean War. This is my father's passport picture. He was 19 years old. And when... Oh, sorry. This, I have to do this. Sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm a little nervous. Okay, there's the picture books. And there's the poetry. And there's my dad. <laughs> um, when he got to the United States, he could not believe the public library. There were libraries in Korea, but they were university libraries you know, or government libraries. There was no such thing as a school library or a public library. And it is an amazing concept when you think about it. You walk into the library, you walk out with a stack of books, and they say, bye, just bring them back when you're done. Why does that even work? It's like it shouldn't work, but it does. And you can't really do it with anything else, only books. So he was a devotee of the public library for all my life. 
And of course, he did not know American children's literature, but fortunately for him, educators and librarians love to make lists. So he went to the librarians and he said, give me your lists of best books for children. And he methodically went through those lists and help us, helped us find and choose those books. I grew up in the Chicago area. I have a brother and a sister. I am the oldest. And as I said, there was always a tremendous culture of reading in our home. Now, admittedly, it was easier back then than it is now. We did not have the assault of the screen. Okay? We did not have cell phones and tablets and home computers. We did have television. You know, it was black and white. There were four channels. You know, and it simply just wasn't the draw that it is today. So reading was my very favorite thing to do. Like many immigrant families, my parents kept alive traditions from their homeland. Um, this is my brother and I when we were very small, wearing traditional Korean dress. But crucially, one thing that they did not give me was the language. In those days in the United States, immigrants were to try to be as American or more American than the Americans as quickly as possible. And my parents thought that one way to do that would be to make sure that English was our first language. So they did not speak Korean to us at home. Of course, now, of course, I think this is a, just a tragedy. Um, and there is, of course, much more emphasis on bilingualism and learning the language of where your ancestors are from and so forth. But I have tried many times to learn Korean, um, and it, I've failed every time. I understand it's not my fault that adults just do have a harder time learning a new language than young people do. So I really regret that I did not learn it as a child. However, the flip side is that when I grew up, eventually, I had a very um, desperate, almost, need to learn about Korea and Korean culture because I had grown up with things like the food and the holidays and so forth, but I knew very little about the history and the language. And had it not been for that desire, I don't know what my first books would have been about because my first books were exploring the connection that I had or lacked to Korean history and culture. So, oh, and this is my, um, my um, bookworm stage, where all I did was read. In the summertime, my mother would set the oven timer for 3 p.m. I was allowed to read during the school holidays until 3 p.m., and then the alarm would go off and I would have to go outside to play, because <laughs> she thought I was incredibly lopsided, only wanting to read all the time. So, okay, hang on one second. Um, while Korean culture and history influences much of my work, I have one book that is specifically about my family's history, and it is called When My Name Was Kyoko. It is a book set during World War II in Korea, when Korea was occupied by Japan, and it is a book about my parents' childhood. When I began researching Korean history out of my own curiosity. I learned that during World War II and during the entire period of the Japanese occupation, Koreans were required to change their names and take Japanese names. And I was stunned by this, right? And I asked my mother, I said, you were alive during this time, did you have to change your name? And she said, oh, of course. Of course, what do you mean, of course? That is not an of course thing. They had not told us, again, like many immigrant families, stories about their childhood and growing up that were painful. Okay? They told us the happy things. They shared with the, us the things that were easy to share. And when I wanted to write this book, initially, my mom was very distressed. She said, this is a very hard time for our family. This is a very hard time for me and your father personally, you know, you are asking us many questions that are difficult for us to answer. Um, and besides, do you really think American children want to read about this? You know, so, um, and, but eventually, you know, she began to, I wouldn't say enjoy, but she began to realize the value of sharing those stories with us. And of course, many of them did end up in the book. 
And then it progressed to the point where she came with me to a book conference, and her Japanese name was Kyoko. So that is why the book is called When My Name Was Kyoko. And then I found towards the end of the conference that she had her own signing line, and she was signing the book because she was Kyoko. <laughs> so, so eventually it sort of came to the point where she, she understood that this was something people did want to read about. But the book I want to talk to you most about today is called A Long Walk to Water. And your grade six students at Neve Academy have read this book, and I met with a delightful group of them yesterday who had very incisive and probing questions for me. And I really enjoyed talking to them about a book, this book. This book is set in what was then Sudan and is now South Sudan, and it is about a friend of our family who was a refugee, a so called lost boy of Sudan, who was.、Um, Who went through this very difficult time during the 1980s and 90s during the Second Sudanese Civil War? So、um, he was like the boys pictured here, having to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles for safety and enduring hardships and terror and things that no child should have to go through. So eventually, After many years, he made his way to the United States and he was relocated to Rochester, New York, which is where I live now. And my husband was the first to meet him. My husband is a journalist, and my husband wrote some stories about his remarkable life. And they were so incredible and so inspiring that I decided I wanted to introduce his story to young readers. Salva eventually grew up to fund a water nonprofit. And I know many of you are familiar with these sorts of water because you have water nonprofits because you have water issues here in India also.、Um, he、uh, began a nonprofit organization called Water for South Sudan. So there were these two parts of his life that I really wanted to introduce young people to. And that was his escape from the war when he was just 11 years old. And what he's doing now as an adult, bringing clean water to remote villages in South Sudan. These two periods of his life were separated by about 25 years. And I could have written his entire life story, but the book would have then been three or four hundred pages long. And I knew from my own experience of many school visits that this would be a very difficult book. For teachers to use with their students if it was that long. I wanted a 100 page book. So that meant skipping this huge chunk in the middle of his life. Not really skipping it. You know, I do touch on it, but there's much less detail. And I thought, you know, I have wonderful readers. They're going to notice that there's this big hole in the middle of the story. How can I sort of cover up that hole? I decided to introduce a second character, a young girl named Nia, who lives in South Sudan today and whose life is profoundly affected when Salva brings a clean water well to her village. So she is one of these typical young Sudanese girls who walks many hours a day to bring water to her family.、Right? So her story alternates with Salva's throughout the book. And I hope that that alternation kind of covers up the hole that's in the middle and that people don't notice it quite as much. So that is how Nia's story came to be. Now, the book was published in 2010, and what I hoped was that it would be a great example for young people about that cliche of how one person can make a difference. But that is not what happened. What happened stunned me and still stuns me today. What happened was that young people read this book and went to their adults, their educators, their parents, their teachers, and said, What can we do to help Salva and to help Nia? Teacher after teacher have told me that this was child driven, this was student driven, that they did not propose this, their students were the ones who asked this question. So,、uh, Salva's not for profit Water for South Sudan contacted me and said, You know, we're getting a lot of letters from schools 
and from students who want to help. So they began to develop a program through which students could help、um, uh, Salva's organization raise money and、um, build wells, right? And it's called the Iron Giraffe Challenge because the drilling rig that they use、um, looks like an iron giraffe.、Right? Okay, so this began, and the organization learned what worked well and what didn't work as well, and so forth. And to date, since about 2013, when it really got started, students have raised almost five million U.S. dollars. For Salva's organization, which is responsible <laughs> for more than 400 clean water wells in South Sudan, serving about half a million people. I yeah. <laughs> I still sort of pinch myself because I just never, never anticipated that this would happen. A water well in South Sudan costs about fifteen thousand dollars U.S. to drill. So, if a school raises five thousand dollars, okay, one third of the amount of that,、um, they get、um, a they get a dedicated well. This is their well, the well that their money helped to build. So, the local people come and they make a sign and. They give them the GPS coordinates of their well, so they know exactly where their well is, and they stamp the name of the school into the cement, so that there's a permanent、um, evidence of the school's participation in this event. There's also a friendly competition that happens with schools who raise enough money. Their names are put in a hat once a year, and、um, schools' names are drawn out of the hat. And first prize for the competition is a visit from Salva himself. He comes to their school and he answers their questions, and、um, it is just an incredibly joyous thing.、Um, second prize is a Zoom with me. <laughs> Maybe not not quite as wonderful, but second the second place winners have been very gracious and and、uh, and also have been、um, happy to to have a Zoom with me. So、um, there are incredibly creative ways that educators have found to raise money. Probably the most popular is the walk for water. They have their students go around the track carrying water. Like Nia has to to try to give them a feel for it, and then their communities sponsor them per lap or whatever, and so that's one way that money is raised for donations to、um, to the Iron Giraffe Challenge and eventually going to Salva's organization. They are much more creative than that. There are, of course, your bake sales and your、um, the, uh, wishing wells. They put a wishing well, and you throw your change into it, and so forth. And one of my personal but no favorites is、um, tape your teacher to the wall. Every strip of tape raises money. <laughs> <laughs> so、uh, that's a very creative way that、uh, students get involved and really just incredibly enjoy it. Um, so um, most of the time, I would say these sorts of fundraising drives and this sort of interest is in schools where students have a great deal of privilege, right? But I have also been surprised at the number of schools located in very under-resourced areas of both. The U.S. and the world, who want to help. This is mostly areas where, at the very least, people have water. And the idea of not having water—if you don't have, I guess, air, oxygen comes first. But after that, if you don't have water, you can't do anything. So、um, I remember very movingly、um, a school in a section of the United States of New York City called the Bronx, which was a very underprivileged neighborhood, with students who、um, felt like the whole world was against them, that they had nothing, and they would see, of course, these images from Hollywood and all of these other images of people with great wealth and great privilege, and they felt like they were the forgotten of the earth. And their teachers did this book with them, and the thought that there were people who didn't even have water spurred these young readers, and they raised money. They who had almost nothing,、uh, 
uh, were um, enlightened to the fact that there were people in the world who had even less than they, than they did in a very visceral way. And so they raised money for a well in South Sudan. Um, I guess that's one of the things, because when I do school visits, I am often in schools that can afford an author visit, right? And our, our schools of great privilege. And I often talk to groups of parents at these schools you know, who want me to talk to their students about the importance of reading and why reading is so important to get a really good education because when you have a good education, you can get a better job, and when you have a better job, you can have a better income and more comfort in your life. And I want to push that chain even further. Why do you have a better income? Yes, for more comfort, more choice, more possibility in your life, and greater responsibility. With privilege comes responsibility. My son has a very succinct way of putting it. He said, Ma, you need to make as much money as you can and then do good with it. Right? So that's the, last, that's the last part of it. It's often, you know, let's make a lot of money is the goal. But what do you do then? What's next? Right? You make sure your family's okay. Okay, I get that. Right? But then how much good can you do in the world? Right? So um, if Salva who came from a background of the poorest people on this planet. If he can do this, you know, he inspires me every day. You know, every day I wake up and I think to myself, well, almost every day, okay, so I have bad days, <laughs> but most days I wake up and think, okay, what can I do today, even if it's small, even if it's small, to try to make the world a better place, right? And I had, the, I had these ideas in vague kinds of ways, but he, his story, writing his story and seeing what kids did with it, really solidified that for me. Really made me realize that it had to be a daily thing, an everyday thing, and not a donation once or twice a year. That it had to become a part of my life. Okay, um, as far as parents who want to know about their kids' reading and writing, um, what I say to kids in school is, sometimes grown-ups ask me what I do for a living, and I say, oh, I'm a writer, right? But this is a totally inaccurate answer. I am not a writer. I am a rewriter. <laughs> I do way more rewriting than I do writing. And young people will often say, oh, you're a writer. Writing must be easy for you. You must love writing. And I say, writing is something I love, but it's a challenge, like a video game. If a video game is too easy, you don't play it, right? You put it down. It has to be a challenge to make things interesting, and that's what writing is like for me. And I tell them that when I first write something, it is terrible. I mean, terrible, whether it's a paragraph or a story or a poem, it, it's, it's just really, really awful but it's something that I can work with. And I rewrite it, and I rewrite it, and I rewrite it, and I try to make it a little bit better every time. So I do this with them. They take a piece of something that they're working on, and uh, this is a keyboarding exercise. I say, take one sentence, put it at the top of a blank page, one sentence from your essay or your story, whatever you're writing. Then I set a five-minute timer, and I call this exercise Ready, Set, Go. I said, ready, set, go. You are going to rewrite that sentence as many times as you possibly can in five minutes. I want quantity, not quality. Spelling does not count. Grammar does not count. I want you to write as badly as you can. Okay, their faces are stunned. You want bad writing? Yes, I want terrible writing. Okay, I want you to keep the same meaning of the sentence, but choose different words, different sentence structure, different order. And of course, as you can see, this is an exercise for maybe grades five and up, okay? They need to be good at keyboarding, and they need to um, have some grasp of the kind of sentence structure stuff I'm talking about, right? Okay. I do this also when I do adult workshops, but the kids get it so much better, right? So, ready, set, go. I walk around this room and I say, worse. You can do worse than that. Come on, I know you can do worse than that. 
right? And the kids who love to write, they're having fun. The kids who don't love to write, they're like, you want bad writing? I can do that, right? And everybody's going 100 miles an hour. I've had principals and other administrators walk into the room where it's total silence except for every kid typing as fast as they can, and they're like, what the heck? What are, what are you doing here? So five minutes, ding, the timer goes off, and I just say randomly, how many, how many sentences did you get? It's not a contest, just curious. When I do this with adult groups, five minutes, they'll say, I got five, I got eight, I got 11. The record holder is a sixth grade boy at the American School of London who wrote 42 variations of his sentence in five minutes. So they totally get it, right? So then the next step is I say, I asked you to write terrible. So there is probably not going to be a sentence like number 17 that you can take and put into your essay because number 17 is a horrible sentence. I asked you to write badly. But when you look at all your sentences, is there something you can take? Is there one word or one phrase, or did you get a different idea? Okay, let's do that now. Now rewrite your sentence with ideas from your terrible writing. And they all do it, and they all improve their writing. Right? So I know this kind of thing takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of individualized attention, but I want to give them an idea of how I write. My books take a long time to write. Okay, I have 30 books, but I started 30 years ago, okay? So, you know, um, and some of them were faster than others. But with the short picture books, I do this dozens of times for every sentence. With a picture book, you have no room for flab. I want every sentence to be as good as it possibly can be. With the novels, I do it for most sentences, partly because my beginning as a writer was poetry. Poets are used to rewriting their lines dozens of times, so I carried that over into my novel writing. But I want them to see how just as in any other discipline, writing takes practice and it takes doing the same thing over and over, but a little bit differently every time. When you look at a book, it looks so pristine. It looks like it must have come out of the writer's brain like that. And I want to show them how messy and sometimes awful the process is before you get to that beautiful, pristine page. Okay, so... I said I was lucky enough to grow up with a reading culture in my home. And what I commonly see with many parents who are, okay, busy, we all are too busy, we, none of us have time. But is there a reading culture in your home? Are you saying to your kids, you need to read, you need to be better readers, so you can then be better writers and then go to a good university or whatever, but they never see you reading? So there are many ways to create a reading culture in your home. You put books in every room. What I tell the kids is, I have bookshelves in my bathroom. Yes, indeed. You sit down to do what you need to do in the bathroom and you take a book. <laughs> so, right? Bookshelves in every room. A book with you always. Okay? Do your children see you reading? And I'm talking about a book, a paper book that you hold in your hands because there's evidence, scientific evidence, through brain science, that we process differently on a screen than we do when we read on paper. It's actually different brain cells that fire. Now, maybe in a hundred years, or I hope not sooner than that, but maybe in a, a while, the brain cells that process paper reading are all going to die, because we're all reading everything on a screen, but for now, reading on paper inculcates a deeper level of thinking than reading on a screen. Reading on a screen, we go to the next thing. We go to the next thing, we click on something else, we end up in the Pinterest hole or wherever it is you go. Reading on a screen, reading on a book, um, sorry, on a paper, you don't have that choice. You have to stay with it, which enables thinking to go to deeper levels of the brain. What I say to young people is that you have to keep reading. Reading develops our brains. If you stop reading on paper, the human race is going to get stupider. It is your responsibility to keep the human race from getting stupider. And you do that by reading books on paper. Okay, 
Family reading night, family read-alouds. If your children are the right age, many families have read A Long Walk to Water together, and of course, there are many books that can fulfill this role. I mean, books that you can genuinely enjoy, enjoy as adults, not just that you know, sort of condescending. Okay, I'll read that with you. There's wonderful children's literature, and it's. Are there any adult author? It's better written than most adult fiction. Okay, just saying. Okay, because <laughs> you, because you, you know, we have a very rigorous editorial process where we question so much more than adult writers often get asked. Okay, audiobooks for car journeys, reading with your ears, it counts, right?、Um, do your children see you reading? Bedtime books, not screens. Okay, yes, you can stay up a half an hour later if you read a book. Right, so there are so many ways, and if you you have your re reading specialists or librarians, they will give you more ways, more ways to create a reading culture in your home, and of course, the most important part of all is choice. Oh, what happened? This is not. <laughs> I swear, I did not do this, <laughs> but it's supposed to be the word choice with the e over there. Okay, right.、Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Oh, all they want to read is graphic novels, or I want all they want to read is these easy books or these series or whatever it is. I want them to read literature. I want them to read more serious books. Right? They will. If you allow them to read what they want and enjoy reading, they will get there eventually. Their teachers and their librarians will help them get there, and you will too. Right? But the quickest way to turn a kid off reading is no, you can't read what you want. Okay, let them read what they want. They have to read a lot for their homework and their school and other things. But when they are reading on their own for enjoyment, let them read whatever they want. Okay, that's going to develop those reading muscles in their brains, and eventually they will go on to read the kind of books that you want them to read. I was a huge re-reader as a child. I read the same books over and over and over and over. My dad worried about this. It's like every time you go to a library, you pick the book that you already read. So we developed a system. He would get a stack of new books. I would get two or three books that I'd read before and loved. We would take them home, and he would hide them. I had to read a new book before he would pull out one of the old books. And of course, he knew exactly what he was doing because from those new books, I got more favorites that I then wanted to reread. Right, so there are so many ways to develop a reading culture in your home that are um, um, fun. You know, fun for you as a family. Right? Okay.、Um, I'm just going to check my time because I always, on every single session I've had, I've gone on too long. Okay. All right. Oh, what's that doing in there? That's my new grandbaby. She's not supposed to be in there. Okay. <laughs> I want to tell you about my two. New books that are coming out, and they are very inspired by my participation in the children's book community as a whole. In the past few years, there have been several books that have come out in the United States about black or African American hair. Okay,、um, it's got a different texture than majority white people's hair, right? And for a long time, that was considered a huge negative. Now. Members of the African community are taking back their hair. Okay, they are celebrating it. Right, they are not ashamed of it anymore.、Um, one of the biggest examples is a book called Hair Love by Matthew Cherry. Yes, published by our own Namrata Tripathi. Namrata, <laughs> there she is. Yes. So that is that is one of the many books that started this trend. Okay, and I was like, okay, I can do that too. I can do it for Asian eyes. Asian eyes have been <laughs> have been teased and degraded, and you know, for years in my childhood, I was the only Asian in my school as a little girl. I suffered greatly from the teasing about my eyes and so forth. And I'm like, so I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a book like that, and it's called Smiling Eyes. Illustrated by、um, Lenny Wen, who is Malaysian Chinese, so you will see a great variety of Asian eyes. That they do not all look alike, <laughs> right? And、uh, she's done just a beautiful job illustrating, including one verse、um, 
which is, uh, by the way, and this is for very young children. This is for, you know, uh, up to kindergarten, first grade. Okay, very young children. And there is one verse about glasses. I have had to wear glasses since I was very, very small. I don't often see glasses celebrated, right? I love my glasses. <laughs> first of all, I can't see without them. But second of all, the frames thing. It's so fun. You get to go in and you get to choose a new frame. I have this crazy optician who always pushes me into glasses that I'm like, what? Um, so I wanted a verse about glasses in there. Um, so kids who wear glasses were like, hey, you know, this is okay. This is cool. So that's Smiling Eyes. That will be out in January 2025. So it's a little while yet, but it's not that long. Time goes fast. So January 2025, um, Smiling Eyes, HarperCollins, Ali Da. Okay. I am also on the advisory board for The Rabbit Hole, which is going to be a National Children's Literature Museum for the U.S. in Kansas City. It is a gigantor project. It has been many years in the making. Um, the uh, people who started it, um, of course, had to have... Um, had to, have, had to raise millions of dollars. And one of the ways they did so is they asked their board to contribute. So I wrote a poem called My Book and Me, and it was eventually turned into a book illustrated by the amazing Caldecott winner, Chris Roshka. So My Book and Me is about um, a child who absolutely loves their books and takes them with them wherever they go. And I'm looking forward to to the publication of that book, which will be February 2024. Any minute now, right? Okay, so, okay. Um, I am supposed to now take questions, so I'm very happy to do that. So, um, is, is there, okay, mics are coming. So I see someone in this front, on the second row, and we'll start there. Uh, as you mentioned in the start, you said you wrote over 30 uh, books for children specifically. Uh, two questions. One, which one do you think is your best book out of those? Second, which one do you think took the longest? Oh, okay. Great. I'll take the second question first because it's easiest. Um, when I visited with the young people who have read A Long Walk to Water yesterday, I told them that they were reading draft number 17. Okay, I wrote it once, I rewrote it 16 times before I thought it was good enough for them. Okay. When My Name Was Kyoko, the World War II story. Now, part of that might have been because my parents kept saying, no, 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 that's not what it was like. <laughs> but I ended up having to write, um, the one that was published was number 37. So 37 drafts of that book before I got it right. So that probably took the longest. I can't remember exactly, but maybe three, three and a half years before I wrote that. Now, which one is my best? Sometimes people ask me that. Okay, I have two children a daughter and a son. I love them both very much, but on some days, my daughter is my favorite because my son is giving me a hard time, he's not listening, he's not cooperating. Other days, my daughter is the one who's not listening very well and my son is my favorite, right? So, this is true of all my books. It really is. I know it's not a satisfying answer, but it's a true one. Yesterday, when I was standing up in front of those um, grade six kids, a Long Walk to Water was my favorite book. Probably the honest answer is the book I'm writing right now. It's not out yet, but I want it to be my best book ever. I don't always succeed, but I try, and I hope it's going to be my best book ever. So it's the one I'm writing right now, which is not even out in the world yet. Thank you for your question. Um, how do you get inspired to write? What right. brings on a book? Right, so um, most of my books come out of what I would call passion. There's something that I feel extremely violent about that the world that I need to share with the world. So, for example, the novel I'm working on right now is about snorkeling because I love to snorkel. I love to see what's under the water. It's just incredible, right? So, my book and me is about my lifelong love of reading. So often it's, it's passion. But inspiration comes from other places. It's an idea I might not have thought of. For example, the books about black hair that, that inspired um, um, Smiling Eyes, right? And yet, that is still passion because, you know, I have lived a lifetime of having Asian eyes, right? So um, I have periods when I think, wow, what a great career I've had. I'm done. I have no more ideas. 
And that dry period can last six months, it can last a year. It actually lasted almost the entire pandemic. During the pandemic, I thought I might never write again. My brain was just totally like in panic mode, sort of, you know, over what was happening. Um, but so far, I've been fortunate that an idea has come to me eventually, sooner or later. But especially with the novels, it has to be something you're absolutely crazy about because you're going to be living with it for a year, a year and a half, two, three years. So um, it's, it's um, mostly born out of my passion. I'm trying to figure out how to write a book for young people about knitting. I like to knit. <laughs> so so you, you don't speak Korean or know Korean. That, that, is that an advantage or a dis is it, does it, is it open eyes or is, is it a blind spot? Right. I mean, yes. what's your net calculation? Right. It could be give you open eyes to see what people don't see or, or is it a blind spot? I think it's both. I think you're absolutely right. So there are times when I feel like I can be a good interpreter for American audiences, because that's who I write for. I write for mostly a U.S. audience. I've been fortunate that I have many books in translation, but sometimes, you know, you have some distance, and it, it gives you the ability to see a bit more clearly. However, I have always felt, well, not always, since I was a teenager or college, that not having the language is a huge disadvantage. So I always am careful to say to people that I am Korean-American. I am not Korean. Being Korean-American is way different from being Korean in so many ways. Um, as just an example, many Asian cultures have this concept of face, which is um, preserving someone's dignity. Okay? You don't do anything to embarrass other people. You have to save face. Okay? So many cultures have this. But we were raised in America, where um, sort of openness and honesty is more valued than the idea of saving face. So for the first time in many years, my grandfather was coming to visit, and my brother and sister and I were maybe 10 and 8 years old, and my sister was younger, she was 5, and my parents went into total panic, and they tried to give us like a three-week crash course in saving face. <laughs> There was no way we were going to learn it, right? They were just like, okay, they sort of settled for, just don't talk to grandfather. Because <laughs> they were so terrified that we would say something like, like, why are you so old, or whatever, something that would not, you know. Uh, so it was the difference between being Korean-American and being Korean, and also not having the language. So um, I have, uh, you know, you, 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 you have what you have in your life. I didn't learn Korean as a young person. It's too difficult. It's been too difficult to learn now, sorry, I know I'm almost out of time, but I, I told the kids, I told the kids for years that one of the few Korean phrases that I could say was, Pyeon Sol Odi So Yo, which means, where is the bathroom? I got that phrase from my parents, okay? So I eventually had a little girl, like trembling, she was so scared because she was about to make me lose face. She was a Korean, but she said, she summoned up all her courage and she said, Miss, you are not saying, where is the bathroom? I'm like, what? My parents taught me that. She said, you are saying, where is the outhouse? Because that's what my parents had had when they were growing up. They taught me to say, where is the outhouse? <laughs> Instead of, where is the bathroom? So I have corrected that, and now I know how to say, where is the bathroom properly. But once again, those differences, but you have what you have in your life, and so you, you do what you can with it. You know, so I wasn't able to give my, my kids Korean either, um, but one of my nephews has gone off to Korea to immerse himself and to learn Korean, and can just hope these sorts of things, you know, can happen. In the meantime, I wrote books about being Korean first, historical fiction, and now books about being Korean-American. So, doing the best I can, like we all do. So. So. Hi, one last question. Okay. Sorry, here. Um, here, right the back. Okay. Hi. So you make it sound really easy. You've put out 30 books, but there must be a process. I mean, how do you, you know, wake up every morning? Do you, yes. do you go at it? Do you keep time just for it? You've been a mother, you have two kids. Yes. So what is that part? Right. Is, it, is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult always, but um, I am a huge fan of, I guess, organizational expert called, call it chunking, tiny tasks. Okay, very small tasks. So I have a timer on my phone, which I set for 12 minutes. It's called the Pomodoro Method, which you can look up. The Pomodoro Method for writing. And it's usually 30 minutes. 
I couldn't make it. I tried again and again and again, and I could not write for 30 minutes. I kept lopping off a minute, and I finally found my sweet spot at 12 minutes. I set the alarm for 12 minutes. I type fast and badly for 12 minutes. It goes ding, and I stop. Now, if I'm going well on your phone, you just hit restart, and I go another 12 minutes. And I have fooled myself into writing for a whole hour. If I had said I must write for an hour today, I never would get started. But I'm going to do 12 minutes and hit the thing and hit 12 minutes again. And sometimes it's only one 12-minute session. But because it's 12 minutes of bad writing, I can do that. And the next day, I will begin my writing session by rewriting that 12 minutes from the day before. So that process happens over and over and over again, but it always happens in tiny chunks.、Um, I look after my grandkids still, who, still who are school age. They get to my house off the bus at 3:30. At three o'clock, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, they're almost here! Quick, 12 minutes!" I get into bed at night. Oh God, it's been such a busy day. <sighs> I didn't do my 12 minutes. I get out of bed and I do my terrible 12 minutes. If it was a half an hour, I wouldn't do it, but 12 minutes I can do. And every single one of my books gets written 12 minutes at a time. So I hope it works for some of you in whatever you do. Thank you so much for coming today. I just had one last question. Oh、Mira. yes.、Um, oh yes. Yeah. Sorry.、Um, We're going to let her ask her question. So, <laughs> so、um, you know, for the last couple of days, I've been、um, I've been tracking so many of the comments that you've made, and、um, you started with the authors' retreat where you said identity is not universality yes and、um, i'm listening to so many of the things that you're saying right now and、um, you know the ability to be able to observe your thinking almost you know just the outhouse comment that you made and the smiling eyes and just so much of stuff the ability to observe yourself seems to be、um, something that drives your writing so how do you weave you know any comments for us as educators you know for our children On、um, and we often don't do that, you know. We are often in such a rush, and we are always thinking of what does somebody want to see you write, or what does want to see、uh, someone see coming out of you. So the ability to observe yourself and then derive beauty from it and derive ideas from that. Any thoughts? Any um, um, specifically with regard to writing? And、it's、I think great, it's, you know、yes. it's me more than anything else yeah, because yeah. I'm constantly trying to see. What the other person wants to see out of coming out of me, so I think it's、uh, advice. Right. So、um, I think with regards to writing, I think sort of becoming self-aware is a really difficult process, and、um, most of us are not very good at it.、Um, but we try. You try because it's very important in your relationships with other people and with the world. In the case of writing, I started writing poetry when I was very small. Poetry is the 12-minute thing. It's a tiny little bite that anybody can do. When I'm doing writing workshop with kids, with even young kids, we do an acrostic poem of their name. So L I N D A. Tell me about yourself with the L and the I, and then they and they think, no, I can't write poetry, and then they do that, and they've written a poem. So writing poetry, which、um, is Can be very reflective. It has to do with image and metaphor. And I wrote poetry for、uh, 30 years before I tried to do any other kind of writing. You know, and I think I mean nobody wants to hear. Okay, you want to write? Go and write poetry for 30 years. But that was my process, and I'm not saying that it would work for everybody. But I think that led to everything. It led to why I rewrite the way I do. It led to the 12-minute chunking, you know.、Um, and I wish back in the day, some of you are as old as I am. You had to memorize poetry, right? And it became a part of you. It became in your cells, in your blood. They don't do that anymore in schools, hardly at all. And so I think that poetry, which is so universal. Almost every culture in the world has poetry. I think there's something there. I'm not smart enough to know on a scientific level how that works, but that's what it was for me. Is it led to all of these, you know, other, other? It had all these other great ramifications. Does that help any? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Again, thank you all for coming, and I hope you've had a wonderful festival.